I'm trying to come to terms with the fact that California is a different country, a different culture. You just get thrown off guard because you can mostly speak English there. <laughs> it's October 1989. I'm stepping out of my classroom at San Jose State University, where I've been teaching for about 16 months. But I can't connect with my students. They're lovely, they're sunny, they're cheerful. They, they come forward with every assignment undaunted. But I can't connect with them, at least not yet. And here's the campus, it's lush and green, there are flowers blooming, that is just wrong. <laughs> I get into my old beat up Toyota Starlet, now that car has been through many Boston winters, it knows a winter. And I get on the highway. It is five o'clock and there should be a ton of traffic, but it's the third game of the World Series being played at Candlestick Park in San Francisco, 50 miles to the north. And the roads are empty. I've got the highway to myself. I'm listening to all things considered. And there's, there's, there's something wrong with the steering in my car. There's some, I, I can't quite get it in control. A cartoon image comes to my brain. There's the car with a big smiley face. There's a wheel with a little smiley face. And the two of them are bopping along, but the wheel is slowly inching off the axle. And they don't know. What do you do when your wheel falls off your car? I have no idea. All I can think of is driving in Boston winters, so I slowly pump on the brakes. Slowly bring the car to a stop, pull over on the shoulder. Oh, I step out. I am so glad to have my feet on solid earth, and I look at my wheels. There's nothing wrong with them. No flats. The wheels are sturdy. What was that? I get back in the car. I ease onto the road. I'm slowly gaining speed, and now I notice there's a woman. She's checking the wheels of her car. There's a man. He's checking the wheels of his car. Now, we can't all be losing our wheels at the same time. <laughs> I roll down the window, and I slow down, and I say to the woman, hey, hey, do you think we just felt an earthquake? And she says, yeah, it was an earthquake. And she laughs. And I laugh. <laughs> and I start to speed up the car again. There's no all things considered coming out of my radio. I hit scan, and that red needle goes up and down the dial, but there's no radio stations on the air anywhere. The big Jersey barriers by the side of the road, they're all beat up. Now my heart is starting to really beat hard, and my breath is shallow, so I think I'm not quite ready to drive over the coastal range to get to Santa Cruz, where I live. So I take the next ramp, and I pull into a restaurant, and all the people who should be in the restaurant are out in the parking lot talking to each other very excitedly. There are two men leaning against a car right near me, so I say, hey, was that a big earthquake? Oh, yeah, that was a big one. I mean, I've lived here my whole life. I never felt an earthquake that big. Well, he describes to me how all the dishes and the plates and the pots and pans came flying off the shelves, how a chandelier crashed down. People rushed for the door and dove under the tables to keep themselves safe. Huh. I have been through a big earthquake. And I don't know if I have a house still standing. I don't know if I should be in California at all. So I get back on the road. Now, I'm approaching Killer 17. This is where the highway goes up over the coastal range, and it's steep, the lanes are narrow, and the curves are tight. Those Californians, they love to take that fast, but we can't take it fast today because there are landslides and boulders and depressions in the paving. We have to go really slowly. And finally, I get to the top of the mountain pass, and that's when the radio comes back on. Well, Bob, that was quite an earthquake. Oh, yes, I've lived here my whole life. I've never felt an earthquake that big. The guys, they're the sports announcers at Candlestick Park. 
The players are still out in the field, not sure what they should do, and the fans are making their way slowly and orderly to the exits. This just in. That was a 6.7 on the Richter scale, and the epicenter is 50 miles south of San Francisco on the coastal mountain range. <laughs> I am 50 miles south of San Francisco on the coastal mountain range. So I make my way home. I see right away there's a water leak, so I turn off the water. I turn off the gas just to be safe and step into the house. It is dusk, so I can just see what's going on. Every book in the house is on the floor. Every wall has cracks in it. And the house is creaking and moaning like an old boat on a rough sea. I thought the earthquake was over, but it is not, not yet, because there are aftershocks. The next two days, we finally get electricity, and that's when we learn that the Bay Bridge broke, that historic buildings in downtown Santa Cruz are condemned, and 25,000 people are living outside because their houses aren't safe. Two weeks later, I walk back into my classroom at San Jose State. Now, I look at my students, where have they been? What have they gone through? We circle up our chairs and we tell stories for 45 minutes. They have such amazing stories to tell me. And as I look at them, I still see that sunny, cheerful thing. But when you live in a state that will throw droughts, floods, fires, earthquakes, when you have to deal with all of that, the best thing you can do is come at it with some sunshine and some good cheer. It's resilience. And I finally feel connected to my students. Right at the end of class, one of my students looks up and says, hey, have you felt an aftershock today? And we all considered the day. And we all burst into smiles and we laugh and we say, not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.